I believe that God has a little bit to say about everything. I mean, rephrase that. I think God has a little bit to say correctly about everything. So let, let, let's have some fun for, for a few moments. And let me start off. This happened a few weeks ago. And as I think about it, I, I think it kind of happened to kind of give me a lead into this series um, that we're starting today, three-week series. And we always preach in series because it gives us a few weeks to unpack some things. And then we'll move on to... to um, something else in the next uh, few weeks, but um, so, so my vehicle, I learned, does this really different thing, and I've just recently learned this, um, so if, if I go out and start my vehicle and drive down the road on my satellite radio, there are preset stations, and so my preset stations are a little bit like this, there's a couple 80s channels, just because it was the greatest music ever. It's all been downhill since then, I'm just saying. Anyway, so if you kind of keep going, there's, there's the 80s channels. You don't believe me. I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll play something right now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and then I have um, Joe Osteen. I know he probably should be in front of the 80s channels, but it's just it's the way it works up here. Um, so then there's a Christian channel. And then there's my sports talk, radio stations. And so I take my daughter to school in the morning, and I, just, I know she's bored all the way there. Um, usually she puts her earphones in because I've got sports talk on and, and, and listening to it. And, and, um, but I noticed that if I, remember we had cold days. Remember all those cold days we had? How could you forget, right? It's blistering cold. Anyways, um, so here, here's what I, I found out, that if I remotely start my vehicle, it, what it does is it, it sets different channels for whatever reason on its own. And I didn't really realize this. I'm not real sure why it does it, but if I start it, the channels are there. If I remotely start it, it's just, it'll open a random channel. And I push the button for my channel, and it just goes to something else. So I, I think I was just assuming sports talk was on. Drop my daughter off, and as I'm driving home, I, all of a sudden I start realizing what this lady's talking about on, on the satellite radio. And, and I looked at the station. I don't know who, who the person is. It was kind of like an entertainment channel. And it was a, basically a relationship and, and sex therapist who had her own talk show. And it sort of caught my attention as she's talking. Now, mind you, my perspective is from a, a biblical perspective. But let's just stick that on the shelf. The information that they were sharing was a little mind-boggling uh, as they talked about sex and relationships. And I started to, to, to listen. I, I realized that, that, and I'm not even sure who the person is, but um, they obviously have a huge voice coming from the West Coast to the younger generation. And I, and I think that's their, their target. And they would, the callers would, would come, call in, and, and they would share things about sex and relationships. And as I'm listening to it, I came home, because this happened to me a couple times. And so I came home, and I, I told my wife, I'm like, you wouldn't believe, like, the nonsense and the lack of any sense that was coming across that people were just buying into because they're hearing something. And I told my wife, I said, I know they have a degree, but if they have a talk show, I need a talk show. Because it was ridiculous. And then I started realizing there are just things that have been in our environment, things that culture just taught us, things that just came out of, of entertainment that have just taught us and we have taken our cues from and we have taken our emotions from and we've taken our actions from. And I do believe that we need to declare the word of God so we can hear truth. Because the Bible says if you hear truth and you apply truth, actually you're set free. And so over the next few weeks, I just want to share some truth with you in this area. And, and you probably see on, on the note card there um, my, my topic. And you're probably wondering, why would you take a Sunday morning to talk about this? Well, we have people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different angles, a lot of different places in life. And I want my messages to, to hit everybody. And I do believe as long as it's the word, it hits everybody. And so I'm going to give you some truth. And over the next few weeks, you're going to get revelation, freedom, and we're going to arm you with the word of God. Now, uh, so let's just jump into things. First Thessalonians, and I, I'm overwhelmed by your excitement so far. Just want you to know. Um, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless at the coming of Jesus. So the Bible is very clear here, and it says this in Hebrews, and, and this will help you. When I learned this principle, man, it helped me. And it says this, that you are made up of three dimensions, a spirit, a soul, and a body. And the Bible tells us we need to do our part to guard those areas of our life so, so they can be kept blameless. 
So let's talk about this. You have a spirit. That's the inner person. That's the core person. That's the part of you when you came to Jesus, you got born again, it was saved. It's an eternal part of you that's going to live on forever. That's the part of your life that the Spirit of God awakened when you became born again. That's the part of you when you sit in here and worship. And you sit in here right now and you hear the word, that's the part of you that comes alive. That's the part that faith energizes and interacts with. That's your spirit, man. It will live on e eternally in heaven or hell, so that's your spirit. Then the Bible says you have a flesh. That's this stuff right here. That's the tent you live in. That's the um, dwelling that you live in. That, that's the part of your life that is completely alert 24-7 to natural, uh, the five senses. So we have a spirit and we have the flesh. And Paul said it this way. Paul said, there's this battle that goes on me in me. It's between my spirit and my flesh. And I, I have this motivation to do right, and I have this other thing that keeps pulling me into my natural impulses. Anyone ever felt that battle? Half of you. The, the other half. Y'all can go home. You're just more spiritual than the rest of us. But So it's this battle that goes, I want to do what God, but there's this thing that pulls my natural flesh. But the Bible said there's this third part of us. It's the soul. Now, the soul is your mind, will, and emotion. It's the heart of a person. Mind, will, and So it, it's the seed of your life. So it, it's your mind. It, it, it's your thinker. It's your will. That's where your emotions, your feelings are. And your mind, will, and, and, your, and your emotions. So your will is what you do. So I'll put it this way. There's the flesh and the spirit, and there's a battle between those things. But your soul is your chooser. It's what's going to choose the things of spirit and life, or it's going to be the things that choose of the flesh. But the Bible says we have these three dimensions in our life. Doesn't that, doesn't that help you? Isn't that a cool principle? And we have these dimensions, but the Bible says we need to guard those areas of our life if we want to continue to become uh, live a blameless life or, or live the right kind of life or, or have the right lifestyle. And we need to give attention to those areas of our life because it needs to be preserved in a very, very immoral world. Actually, the Bible says this, above everything that you do, put a guard around your heart. Because out of your heart comes all of the issues of life. I want you to think about this. Guarding that soul area of your life, your, your mind, your will, your emotions. The Bible says, because out of it, it's where our emotions, it's where our issues. Anyone ever had some issues? An issue is something you dwell on. Right? You think on, you act out of it. And so the Bible says we guard these areas of our life because there's going to be issues from our life because of these areas. And so the Bible says this, we need to keep the Word of God at, at, to preserve us, to protect us. Because what the Word of God will do, it will give us understanding, it will give us wisdom, it will preserve our life, it will promote us. The Bible says it will add life to us, it will add days to us. The Bible said it will bring health to your life. And I love this, the Bible said it will bring blessing to our life. So you can take the Word of God, begin to guard your life, begin to live by the Word of God, and it promises the blessing of God on our lives. Isn't that cool? So what, why, what's so big, what's so important about the Word of God? It's God's revelation. The devil's playground is ignorance and darkness, but the Bible says the Word of God is a light. And when we bring the light, it's revelation. Revelation means something was always there, but there was a curtain in front of it. And revelation means the curtain is opened. Here's what revelation is. It's an aha moment where, aha. How about the first time you understood grace? Aha. How about the first time you, you, get, you heard a word about faith? Aha. Well, the Bible said that's what the word does. We need to take the word of God. And, in, and when we obey the word of God, it brings blessing into our life. It gives us an aha moment to live by. So um, let's jump all the way back to Genesis. So I'm going to share some things this morning. You need to hear. I need to hear. They're a little old school, but we need to hear them. Everybody say, here we go. All the way back in the book of Genesis, it says this. And God said, it is not good that man should be alone. How many know it's never good for a man to be alone? He procrastinates. He loses things, right? It's just not good for a man to be. It's just never good, right? Nothing good ever happens for a man just being alone. So God said, now think about this, God is walking and he's interacting with Adam. This is before sin. And God says this, it's not good that you're alone. I'm going to make a helper that's compatible or comparable or suitable just for you. So here's what God did, verse 19. Out of the ground, God formed every beast, every bird, and he brought them to Adam. And whatever Adam called each creature, that was its name. 
So Adam gave names to the cattle, the birds, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there wasn't a helper that was compatible or suitable for him. So God said, you're alone. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make you a pet. And I know some of you love your pets. You love Fluffy. But, 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 but as awesome as Fluffy is, it's still not what Adam needed. So God made all the animals, and he brought them to Adam and said, whatever you call them, that's what their name is. But it wasn't suitable, so here's what God did. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. Right here, ladies, this is an anointing from God that men have. We can sleep anywhere, anytime. You're worrying, what are we doing? We're snoozing. And you're nagging us, God gave it to us, is what we're to do. It's in scripture, right? It's a witness right here. So he falls asleep, and while he, and we, we have a deep sleep, because look at this. God actually opened up his rib and took a rib out, or took his, opened his flesh and took a rib. We can sleep through anything. Anyone's husband like that? My wife hears everything at night. What was that? I'm like, just go to sleep, and you won't hear it, right? Just, she's like, you're going to check it out? I'm like, well, I am now. I wasn't really going to, but anyway. So God took this rib out. And the rib that God took out, God made a woman, and he brought her to Adam, and I love Adam's response. So he brought Fluffy, and Adam's like, yeah, okay, nice pet. But then he brings this woman that he created out of Adam, and Adam said, now this is what I'm talking about. This is bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, whoa, man. That was Adam's response, whoa, man. So he's happy about this because she was taken out of him. Therefore, therefore means there's a reason this is there. What God did, therefore, a man's going to leave his mom and dad, and he's going to be joined to his wife and become what? One flesh. And they were both naked. Everyone say naked. <laughs> I like how you said that. Some of you are like, uh, can I say that in church? Yeah. <laughs> naked, right? So they were naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So the Bible said this is why. God calls a man and a woman. There was no confusion other than man and a woman. And he built this unique relationship. Jesus actually talked about this in Matthew chapter 10. It says this, from the very beginning of creation, which we just read about, God made them male and, okay, just checking. He made them male and female. And there's a reason, for this reason, man leaves his father and mother, and he's what? Joined to his wife. And the two become what? One flesh, and no more are they two, but they're one. Therefore, that which God has joined together, don't ever let anyone separate. Now, when we read this verbiage that says they were one flesh, it's talking about sexual intercourse. And so, um, we started off, and I said, you are... Spirit, soul, and body. And now we're seeing this phrase, you are one. So when a couple are engaged in a sexual relationship, the Bible says they make a forever bond. And it's a bond that is spirit, soul, and body. You, you, you think you can, but you can't just regulate it to just physical. And you can't regulate it just emotional. There is a forever bond and a transference in the spirit, in the soul, and in the body. And so there are natural fluids that are transmitted. And there are also um, parts of DNA. And there's also parts of the spirit and the emotions. And all of that is transferred. And so I did something a, a few weeks ago. Um, I did some in-house research. And let me explain that before you're trying to figure out what that means. All that means is I walked around the office and I engaged the members of my team that are married. And there, there are several different years of marriage. We'll be 25 this fall, a blissful, wonderful, exciting, loving relationship. And then there are those who are like 14 years, 7 years. So there's all these different years. And I, I said, I'm, 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 I'm trying to prove my theory, which what I was doing was backing up what Scripture said. And I said, I just want you to think about this. Over the years of marriage, whether it's 25, 14, 7, whatever it is, could you say that you have become more like your partner, more like your spouse? And they thought, and they said, yeah. I said, so 
even some of your traits, even some of your personality. Yeah, I said, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Yeah, I said, well, that's what scripture says, that we actually become one spirit, soul, and body. And that's what scripture is teaching us. And we'll learn more about this as we go on in this series. I'll unpack it more. And so there, there's this forever bond, and there's this transference of, of, of all of us, all of our essence, because we have become one, no longer two. Now let me read you another, I've got a few more scriptures than usual, but in Leviticus, listen to what God tells Moses. Now remember, God chose Moses as a leader, and Moses is about to bring all of Israel out of the Egyptian culture into a promised land. And God said this to Moses, speak to Israel and tell them this, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwell, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan where they were headed, where I'm bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You should obey or observe my judgments, keep my ordinances, walk in them. I'm the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes, my judgments, which if a man does, he will live by them. Here's what God was telling Moses. I want you to tell all of Israel that we just are coming out of Egypt and we're going into Canaan, but do not buy into practice or take your cues from the culture that we're coming out of or that we're going into them. If you will live by my ordinances and my principles and my word, you're going to live. But if you live by these, you'll die. And, and let me translate that to 2019. As believers, we are in a world and we are in a culture, but we're not to be of it. And, and, and so we should not, one, be surprised by the culture we live in because they're just acting by, like the world and that's all they know. And we should not be judgmental against them because they're just living according to what they know. But for you and I, it's different. We're to live by the Word of God. We're to filter our life by the Word of God. We're to regulate our life by the Word of God. And if we do so, it's different than culture. I remember several years ago working, I, I, um, I used to work in the, in the summers in the oil and gas field. Many, many of you do the same. And it's not the most um, pleasant or pure place. The language, the actions that go on there, and, and, and I remember as being a young person making a commitment to live by the word of God, um, they, they would challenge me on it and make fun of me on it. But I just decided I, I'm going to honor God, not, not, not their opinions. But there are things that come especially in the, in, through the media whether that's movies or whether that's music or whatever it might be, that you and I need to make sure we filter. And now, not every movie is wrong, not every song is wrong, but it should be different for you and me where we're taking our input from. And we are all like a computer. I can't get something out of my laptop that I did not want input into it. And the things that are inputted into our life is what comes out. And we, we've got to make sure. See, there, there is... Um, um, for those of you, a lot of you will understand this. There's some of you, I'm about to blow your mind. Back in the day, we didn't have flat screen TVs. The back of that TV was like. And I know y'all don't believe this if you're, if you're a millennial or if you're younger. But you used, to, um, you used to be sitting there. And there were like, if you had cable, there were like 12 channels. If you didn't have cable, there were like three and they were fuzzy. And so you're sitting in your seat. If you didn't like what was on TV, you actually had to get up out your chair, walk all the way over to the other side of the room, and turn the channel. Then you walk back, and you sit down in your chair, and then you didn't like that, so you had to get back up out of the chair. Everybody was in shape back then, Then you turned the channel. Anyone ever remember doing such a bizarre thing? But what happens today? We got like 400 channels, and we have a remote, and we're just like, no, I don't want that. I don't want Everything is on. There's so much on. There's stuff you don't even want to see that's on. There's stuff I don't even know how it got on TV. You ever find one of those channels? Like, what, how did, I need a show. How did this get on TV? What are they selling? What, what, what are they doing to the, 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 it's just crazy what's on TV. Not, not bad stuff, just how you get a channel about gardening. Selling how, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff. It, it, my point is, what is my point? My point is, we need a filter in our life. It's the will of God and it's the ways of God. 
And we cannot adopt the culture's information. And so God really, really, it, back in the fall when I started putting together what God gave me for series this year, he gave me a series and he gave me the title. And he said, I want you to do a series called Sex in 3D. And so for the next few weeks, it, it's not just a marriage series, not just for singles. Just stick with me for a few weeks because I'm going to teach you what God says. If there's a, a bondage in that area of your life, I'm going to tell you how to get free from it. I'm going to tell you what God says about it. Because um, culture has a loud voice on this stuff. I, I want to give you what God says. And, and so he, he said, do this series. And then so here, here's my title today. I know you've probably already seen it on your card there. But it's Designer Sex. This is why my wife said if you have young kids, you might want to, I'm not going to say anything graphic, just the topic is a little more intense. Designer sex. Here's why I called it designer. Here's why I called it sex in 3D. Because each week starts with a D. <laughs> Plus three dimensions, right? Spirit, soul, and body, right? Amazing how that works out. But designer sex. Here's why I'm calling today designer sex. Because God created it so God should get to set the parameters. And God created it so God should get to set the principles. He's the boss of it. Actually, there was a time in your life when you were, you were messed up. You were jacked up. You were lost. And you heard a message about the love of Jesus. And you heard about grace and faith was inspired inside of you. And you gave your life to Jesus. And you said, Jesus, my life's a mess. Here's the keys to my life. And you made him Lord, which means he's the boss. And I want you to know, when he becomes the boss, it's no longer about my opinion. So I, 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 can't, I can't continue just to have a bad attitude. I'm not allowed because my Lord won't let me. I can't stay in unforgiveness. You know why? Because my Lord won't let me. I can't just work wherever I want to, have whatever career I want to. I can't just date or marry whoever I want to. You know why? Because he's the boss of my life. I can't just live however I want to because he's the boss of my life. And so what he sets as the parameters, that's what I live by. All right, let's start moving here. So Paul, in, in the New Testament, began writing letters to the churches that he started. And he wrote a letter, or actually I think three letters, two of those are in the Bible, to the church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth, especially old Corinth, was a very, very immoral place. And so Paul was writing to work some things out and deal with some things that the church was dealing with. I mean, lots of things. He was dealing with theology with them. He was dealing with strife among them. He, he was dealing with, how about this? He had to write a letter because the church was um, not handling speaking in tongues. They weren't handling prophecy right. So he had to straighten that stuff out. And then he actually had to straighten out because here's what was going on. There were people, and here's what the culture was like. Um, in the Corinthian culture, old Corinth, if you went to the temple to worship, they say there was over a thousand temple prostitutes. So your worship wasn't just a spiritual worship, it was actually a, a physical act with prostitutes. It was very common for the men of that day to be married, and they, this is what they said, that this was their, their belief, that their wife was for domestic help and to bring babies in, and have babies. But they would also on the side have a mistress, and this was common, everyone knew it, and then they would visit prostitutes. Sex slavery was very common. These things were just common in, in, in the culture. And so people of Corinth began to become believers. And so they swung the other way. And, and they began to, um, this, this was their, their, their thinking that now that I'm a Christian, sex should no longer be because it's evil. So now they're living as married couples and they're living celibate lives. And so Paul has to write to this church in the middle of this culture. And he had to straighten some things out. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of 1 Corinthians, this is what Paul is addressing. And so in, in verse number 1, let's read a few verses. It says this, Paul says, Now com concerning these things that we, you wrote to me, he's responding to the first letter, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but nevertheless, because of all of the sexual immorality, let each of you have your own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. And let the husband render, everyone say render. You know what that means? Monkey, monkey, wow, wow. That's what render means. It's translated for you. <laughs> so, what, where am I at? Verse 3. So let the husband render to his wife the affection that is due her, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife 
actually has no authority over her own body. The husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5, so don't deprive one another except if there's a time you consent to where you fast and you pray. But come back together because Satan, doesn't want, because Satan will tempt you because you lack self-control. In verse 6, Paul says, but I say this as concession. In these verses, Paul was sharing his opinion and he's sharing scripture or what God had given him. He, it, well, let me finish and I'll, I'll explain that. Um, it, he says, concession, not a commandment. I wish all men were as myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them to remain as I am, meaning single. But if they can't have self-control, then they should marry. For it's better to marry than burn with passion. Here's what Paul was saying. He was just saying this, hey, it's my opinion, it's better to be single. And here's why he said that. If you're single, you have more time to give God your time. But he said that's not a commandment. It's just a concession. He said, that's my opinion. That's how I live. But I'd rather you be married than burn with passion and live immoral. That's all Paul is saying here. So Paul says a few things. He says, first of all, your body does not belong to you. It belongs to your husband or it belongs to your wife. It doesn't say that. Uh, so it says that your sexual relationship is a privilege and it's a responsibility in the confines of how God created it. It doesn't say that it belongs to a boyfriend or a girlfriend. But he said it becomes our responsibility to pleasure and satisfy our spouse. The reason why Paul writes all of this is because he's trying to protect them from consequences of immorality. And I'll talk more about that next week. But here's a very interesting statistic. How many know God knows what he's doing? And this is a wild statistic. But they say that statistically, 79 uh, born-again Conservative Christians have a 79% greater satisfaction for their sexual life than other people do. That's because the word works. Now, Hollywood, TV, Facebook, whatever, wants to make you think that God's a killjoy and God's against your pleasure and God's against your fun. And that statistic just proves that if you do it God's way and you do it in the parameters that God has, you save yourself from the consequences in your spirit, in your soul, and in your body. So Paul is saying it's, it's a very immoral world. And I'm saying this to you today. It, it's a crazy, crazy hour we're living in right now. But I also would give you this challenge. I believe in this crazy culture we could do what God told Moses. Don't live, don't buy in, don't lower your standard to live by what culture says or what environment may have taught you or what you may have learned. Let's learn to live by the word of God. It will preserve your life, it will promote you, it will protect, it will bless your life. Now, I've got to keep moving because the clock is moving, but I want to read you one more scripture and kind of summarize what I want you to get in your heart today. So Paul is in Corinth and he writes this letter to Thessal Thessalonica, to, the, to a church there, and he says, furthermore, so he's wrapping up these thoughts on immorality, he says, furthermore, brethren, so he's talking to believers, look, look what he says, I beg you and I admonish you because of your union with Jesus that you would follow the instructions you learned from us about how you should walk so you would please God and you would gratify God. Anyone want to please and gratify God? As indeed you're doing and that you do so more and more abundantly and you will attain even greater perfection in living this life. For you know what charges and precepts we gave you on the authority and the inspiration of Jesus. Look at verse 3. This is the inspiration, or this is the will of God. The will of God is the word of God. It's the ways of God. And he says, this is the will of God, that you should have a consecrated, separated, set-apart life to live pure and to live holy. And you should abstain, shrink back from all sexual immorality. That each of you would know how to possess, control, manage your own body in consecration, which means purity, being separated from things that are profane. And you, li you would live in honor. Don't use your life to live in the passion of lust like the world does because they're ignorant of the true God and they don't have knowledge of his will. But God's giving the knowledge of his will to us, not to restrict us, but to bless us. So let me summarize this in three statements from this scripture, how I believe God's word encourages you and I to live. Ready? Here we go. One, we pursue purity. We pursue purity. There, there's a word, a big word used here, but it has a little definition. It's the word sanctification. 
all sanctification means is to be set apart to live holy. In other words, it means to become Christ-like, not culture-like. Now, notice I use the word pursue. See, whatever you're pursuing, you're seeking. Whatever you're pursuing, you're moving in that direction. Whatever you're pursuing is, is dictating the, the way you're going. And I believe this. Paul is saying in, in an immoral, cult, immoral culture, pursue purity. Pursue the word of God. Make it something you're going after. Because whatever you pursue, it, it will engage your time. It will engage your focus. It will engage your efforts. And he says this. He says, be sanctified. And so when we see that, that big word, it just means set yourself apart, your lifestyle, your thought life, your word life, your actions in your life to live what, what basically pleases God. Set yourself apart. In other words, let's make this determination. doesn't matter what culture says. I'm living by what the word of God says. It's not popular. I can deal with that because he saved me. Come on, somebody. Are you all hearing me this morning? It's old school message, but we need to hear it. Let's just pursue purity. There's strength in, in, in this in, in purity. Now, the word sanctification, there, there are actually three different phases of sanctification. Aren't you glad you came? Big words today. There is a positional, progressive, and perfected sanctification. Let, 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 let me make it simple. There's past, present, and future. The moment you got born again or became a Christ follower, you were sanctified in your position. You went from lost to found. You went from lost and hopeless to full of hope. You went from unsaved to saved. You went from living for yourself to being a Christ follower. And positionally, you were cleansed, you were sanctified, and you were forgiven. Now, the other end of that spectrum is perfected sanctification, which means this, that there will be a day that we are fully sanctified and our lives are fully glorified when we stand in the presence of Jesus. But in between positional and perfected, there's progressive, which this is all it means. It means we live a life of becoming more holy. We live a life of being more obedient. Now, when I hear the word holy, if you're like me, I think of this little old lady that's been in church for like 87 years. She has nothing to do but sit in a rocking chair and be pure. That's, that's what I think of, except for gossiping. That's another story. But it really has nothing to do with age. It just means this. I'm continuing to set my life apart, and whatever the Word of God says doesn't matter about my feelings, doesn't matter about my thoughts, doesn't matter about whatever culture says. I'm going to live by what the Word says. I'm setting myself apart. If everyone else thinks that's crazy, I'm going to obey what the Word of God says for my life. That's progressively becoming, it's a, I know it's a, an odd word, holy, but it means I'm just becoming more set apart. And I want to challenge you that we all become more set apart. Second thing I take from this story is not only do we pursue purity, but we avoid immorality. Everyone say avoid. Now when we see that phrase abstain from immorality, it is an imperative tense, which means it's a command. Paul's commanding, in an immoral culture, in the days we live in, I give you a word from God, abstain from immorality. Another translation says flee from it. Did you notice it didn't say flirt with it? And did you notice it didn't say resist it in Jesus' name? It said what? Flee from it. Listen, I believe there might be some songs we need to flee from. There's some messages in music. And, and listen, if you're a little older, I know what you're saying. There's these kids today in this rap music. Well, I want you to know that that rap music is as bad as your country music. It just has a better beat, okay? So it's some of the same stuff going on in there. Now, not every song is bad, but I'm just saying, let's not just take those messages and live. But there's some songs we need to flee. There's some movies we need to flee. There's some people we need to flee. It doesn't say resist. It doesn't say flirt. It just says don't welcome it. It actually means put distance between it and you. Check this out. Just can you give me five more minutes? Who give me five more minutes? Five, ten. I got 15, 20 here today. <laughs> this is what the Bible says about purity. It says, if you'll set yourself apart, you'll see God. If your hands are pure, if your eyes are pure. Now, I didn't say perfect. That's why we need grace. But what are you pursuing? Listen, on your way to pursuing the best of God, you're going to stumble some. You're going to miss it some. That's why there's grace. Anyone miss it some this week? But pursue. Pursue the pure things. If you do, the Bible says you'll see God. 
you will see God move on your life. You will see the blessing of God. But the Bible says this, if you don't avoid immorality, you know what it says about immorality? First of all, the Greek word is the word porneia, which is where we get the word pornography from. And it says this, those who are going to practice, immor- and it's talking about a habit here, not just a failure, but the habit of staying in that. The Bible says this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, it doesn't say the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different things. The kingdom of heaven is where you go because you've received Christ. But the kingdom of God is the blessing of God, the authority of God, the power of God, the life of God that happens here and now in our lives. I want the blessing of God on my life. But the Bible says if we're just going to make up our mind that these, this is our habit, that we can't walk in all of those blessings of God. We can shout about it. We can want to. But it's something that stands between us and God. And the last thing is we need to manage our person. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible says we need to possess our own vessel or manage our own body. It actually means two things, personally and your spouse. According to Scripture, isn't this good stuff? According to Scripture, your body is for two people, I mean, other than yourself. Number one, the Bible says it's for the Lord. When he becomes my Lord, my body is for him. All this is his. Actually, that's why the Bible says, have your mind renewed and offer your life as an instrument on a daily basis, as an offering. That's your reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? Because he died for me. He died that I would be forgiven, that I would be changed. And my reasonable, reasonable response is to set my life apart and live for him. I know I'm not going to do it perfect, but I'm going to pursue God's ways. I'm going to pursue morality in an immoral world. And as I do that, guess what God's going to do? He's just going to open heaven. And you say, well, Pastor Aaron, you, you say there's always grace. Listen to me. There is always grace. There is always forgiveness. But in the midst of that grace, it doesn't say it eliminates the consequences that we make, especially relationally. Forgiven, yes, but man, sometimes the consequence can be lots of different things. Then it says the second thing that our body is for is for our spouse. It doesn't say boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, um, It says your husband or your wife. So all this is for him and is for her. And all that is for him and it's for me. And then the parameters God has, and I'll share in a couple weeks what that means. Let me give you this little word that we don't talk about enough. I preached it here, but I just want you to get. And the Bible says this little word I'm about to share with you, the Bible says if you do this, he does it back on your life. It's this little word called honor. It really means you put value on something and you give weight to something. Now, now hear me. First Samuel says this, if you honor him and his ways in return, He honors your life. Will you put weight on his ways? He puts weight on your life. Above everything else, above every message over the internet waves, every message over the audio waves, every message uh, um, through a textbook, every message through a voice, every message audibly, visibly, uh, uh, out of every message, this is the message we need to to secure ourselves in. God, above everything, I'm going to live a life that honors you. And if I'm allowing something that isn't honorable, I'm going to repent of it, and I'm going to pursue God's best. The Bible says this. Every time we obey God, it immediately commands a blessing. If there's some things moral-wise in your life you need to straighten up, repent, get them right, it'll bring a blessing into your life. If there's a relationship you need to adjust, get rid of, get yourself out of, fix so it's moral, God's going to bring a blessing. But you can't stay in it habitually and have the blessing of God. It will not work. Because you are violating the word of God. All the blessings that should be between a husband and wife cannot happen unless they're done God's ways. You might want a different message, but that's the truth. And the truth of the word of God will set you free. So I'm here to set you free. Do the right thing if you need to repent, if you need to make some adjustments, and watch the blessing of God bless your life. I just want to remind everybody, I did not write this book. God breathed. The Bible said he breathed on writers, and they wrote everything he said. 
it's still valuable in 2019. It's still accurate. It'll still fix a marriage. It'll heal a body. It'll change an attitude. It'll adjust some thinking. It's still valuable. And if we honor it and guard our life with the Bible said, it'll actually bring health on your body. It'll actually bring victory into your life. And when you, when you confess and do what's in, this, what's in this word, it'll change your sphere of influence. It'll change your culture can go crazy around me. But for me and my house, we're going to live by the words of Jesus. And there is a blessing on that that nobody can steal from you. And listen, if you've messed that up, I don't want you to get condemned. I just want you to know, I'm going to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I repent. Let's all stand. Let, let, let me close with this. Hey, have you all ever heard of King David? You remember him? He killed a giant, killed a bear. You all, you all remember him? Okay, just checking. I said he was the greatest king. Actually, Jesus came from his lineage. Now, if you study David, although he killed a lion and he did those good things, when he got into his position as king, man, he made some bad decisions. His family was a mess because of some of his moral decisions. The Bible said there was this one time that he should have been out when the kings were at war and he was on his rooftop and he looked down and he saw this lady taking a shower. And because he wasn't where he should have been, he called to have her. He had sex with her. She got pregnant, and then he sent her husband on the front line to be murdered. So now has this child, and they weren't married, and then this child dies. And so there's just all this chaos and consequence in his life. But yet we read this about David. The Bible said he was a man after the heart of God. So how could a man after the heart of God have such a sketchy, behind-closed-doors portfolio well here's why just like you and me we're not perfect but God's a redeemer and David made a decision to be repentive and to have an attitude change a perspective change and because although he had some failures he was pursuing God he didn't make excuse for it and he made some changes and the blessing of God came on his life and the, the Savior was born out of his lineage so I don't know where you're at today with what decisions you may have made or not made or, or how, how you're living right now but I believe that we can repent and make a change and allow God to bless us and I think God would say the same thing you know what they made some mistakes but they, there's a new motive in their life they, they, they're pursuing and they're setting themselves apart See, if we're going to stay right where culture is, we're not in a place for all the best of God. But we get out here and set ourselves apart. It'd be like this. If God's pouring out right here, but yet we're trying to live over here where culture is and want the blessing. But we want a full-time blessing on a part-time commitment. we got to get over here and separate ourselves to a place where I'm going to live my life in such a way that the blessing of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God. The Bible says this. The good things of God are pursuing you, chasing you down, trying to take you over. But you're pursuing some things. When God said, I want to pursue, it'd be like, you're going your way. And God's like, hey, if you just do it this way, I'm trying to pursue you and take. But we're going our own way with our own feelings, our own emotions. But we just make a few adjustments and say, I'm going to pursue the things of God. I'm going to get over here where God can pour out and bless. Bless me, even though it's all immoral all around me. So what am I saying today? God can fix your yesterday. If you'll make some decisions right now, he can fix some tomorrow stuff. And we're going to pray. And you just check your heart. I'm not calling anybody up to embarrass anybody. I just want to have a God moment. And you know, God's speaking to your heart right now. There's some areas we need to repent, clean up. I'm going to help you in this series. Especially if you got some, I was talking to someone out there, and they said, man, I, I've got some stuff in this area. I said, man, wait till next week. I want to tell you how to break that bondage. I mean, you know, the word does that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our time here. God, I thank you for our opportunity to gather and worship and open the word of God. And God, I believe when we open the word of God and we say what you say, God, it's active and it changes us. God, there is not a person in this room that's perfect. But God, I believe there are a lot, a lot of hearts pursuing you. But God, some of our habits, some of our thoughts, some of our words, and some of our actions... God, we just need to repent, and we need to, we need to make some adjustments. Because, God, I want the full blessing of God on their lives. I don't want the part-time blessing. God, I want a full-time blessing on them. And, God, I pray that you help them, bring peace on them, 
encouragement in them to God to, to know that they're righteous in you, not because of their works. God, I want blessings and rewards and not the consequence of wrong habits. So God, I, I, I speak they'd be encouraged. God, I, I pray if there's something they need to repent of, they would just be honest and repent. Thank you, God, that you cleanse us. Can I just break condemnation that's over them? And I just release peace and joy and truth over them. Amen.